good evening and thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're gonna we're gonna learn about wolves of the Northwoods tonight. I'm Jeremiah Walters. I'm the naturalist for the Wild Rivers Conservancy of the St. Croix and Namakagan. And I'm Wendy Tremblay. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator with Wild Rivers Conservancy. Uh, but Wild Rivers Conservancy is the official nonprofit partner of the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway, a unit of the National Park Service. The Conservancy inspires stewardship to forever ensure the rare ecological integrity of the St. Croix and Namakagan Riverway. As a nonprofit, we depend on the support of individuals and businesses throughout the watershed to carry out our important mission. If you're inspired by our work today, please consider becoming a member, volunteering, or participating in one of our many upcoming events. And for those of you who are already supporters, thank you so much. Awesome. So tonight's uh, topic is Wolves of the Northwoods. Uh, originally it was supposed to be in Hayward, but we're gonna make it virtual now. Um, and I think that's for the best as I see that it is snowing and sleeting outside. So we don't want people out on the roads. All right, next slide, please. So our, top, uh, our presenter today on the topic is Adrian. And Adrian, I never did learn how to say your last name. So if you wouldn't mind just popping in real quick and uh, just sharing your last name quick, and then I'll get through your bio. Yep, Adrian Whiteven. Whiteven, well, thank you so much. Yep. So Adrian had uh, obtained a Bachelor of Science degree in biology and wildlife man management at UW Stevens Point uh, back in the day, and then a master's degree from uh, in wildlife ecology from Iowa State University. Um, Adrian has had a lifelong career uh, working with wildlife, um, working in Missouri. Uh, he returned back to Wisconsin and uh, worked out of uh, Oshkosh, Appleton, and Schwano. Um, and then he moved up to Park Falls, heading up the state wolf recovery and management programs and other programs for non-game wildlife in northern Wisconsin. He was involved in he was involved with monitoring and management of American martens, surveys for lynx, investigations of cougar observations, surveys of other carnivores, serving on the state wolf, uh, fur bear, elk, martin, and bat advisory committees, as well as other state and federal wildlife advisory committees. In February of 2013, he began to work as a forest wildlife specialist, promoting forest management practices that enhanced or protected habitat for various forest wildlife species, working closely with foresters, land agencies, and landowners. Adrian retired from the DNR on January 3rd in 2015. He worked part-time as coordinator of the Timberwolf Alliance with the Sigurd Olson Environmental Institute at Northern College in Ashland. Uh, in two, uh, from 2000, two, 2015 to 2017, um, that's when he did that. And then he continued to volunteer as chair of the Timberwolf Alliance Advisory Council and does not contract and does contract with the Sigurd Olson Environmental Institute for workshops and does talks like this. Um, he does volunteer wolf, bird, bat surveys and snapshot camera surveys for the Wisconsin DNR. Uh, today, he is continuing to be interested in working on issues involving wolves and other carnivores and just wildlife in general. Uh, he lives up near Cable, so uh, Hayward would have been a really short uh, drive for him, but uh, we're doing it virtually today. So, Adrian, without further ado, uh, please please uh, enlighten us on the wolves of the Northwoods. Thank you. Uh, so, let me see my screen share here, get my talk up. And so, okay, can I move? Let's see, I need to move, okay. So thank you for having me this evening. Uh, yeah, as uh, Jeremiah had mentioned, it would have been nice to do this in person and maybe have a beer with a Q&A at the end, but uh, uh, we'll have to do it virtually and, and hopefully um, people will still get some good information out of this. Uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to try to talk about tonight more is uh, the biology, ecology of wolves and how they spread through our area. I'm not going to talk too much about wolf management, although I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. And when we have the Q&A, open it up to questions, any questions folks have on wolves in Wisconsin or beyond. I've had some experience with wolves beyond Wisconsin as well, or even about those cougars and some of the other critters we've uh, followed around. Um, so, but uh, 
The one big news item today that many of you might have heard, and I'll talk a little bit about at the end, is that as of today, gray wolves in Wisconsin are again on the federal endangered species list. They were off the list as, uh, as of January of 2021. Uh, we're off the list for uh, a little over um, uh, 13 months, but uh, and that resulted in a bit of a hunt last year. We'll talk about that at the end. But having said that, let's move on and talk about wolves and their ecology and biology in Wisconsin. So <clears throat> the animal we're talking about is a gray wolf and we refer to gray wolves in our area as the Great Lakes gray wolves. And here are a variety of examples of what those wolves look like. And, and you can see the color overall is kind of a grayish color. Uh, this average size of an adult male is about 80 pounds in our area, females about 70 pounds. The largest wolf we ever captured in live capture operations in Wisconsin was a 108 pound wolf. I think there might have been a larger wolf caught in the last year or so, but they didn't have a, a scale uh, that went over 110 pounds. So I think it was coming in close to 110 pounds. And the things you see about the wolf is they're very long legged animal. They're obviously canid uh, characteristics, but uh, narrow, more narrow chested than most of our dogs. And you especially see that when you see them in their summer coats, their winter coats, they tend to look heavier. They're, they have those thick coats. And they actually, they do weigh a little bit more in the wintertime than they do in the summertime. But these give you a variety of images of what gray wolves look like in our region. And we call them gray wolves because that's the overall color pattern. But you look at them carefully. There's tans and cinnamons and browns. Uh, there are occasionally black wolves in our region, although those, those are kind of rare for our part of the country. In places like Yellowstone, about half the wolves are black. In Wisconsin, it's probably less than 5% are black. And white wolves are extremely rare. Uh, we probably only get white wolves from very old wolves. That, that when they get old, it's kind of like some of us turning gray or turning our hair turning kind of whitish color. The animal we most often confuse wolves with are the coyotes, which are only about half or a third as the, the weight of a wolf, uh, weighing from 20 to 45 pounds. The average adult male in our area is about 31 pounds, a female is about, about 26 pounds. Wolves stand about 30 inches at the shoulder, coyotes only about 20 inches at the shoulder. They tend to be shorter legged, uh, more dainty legged, more taller, uh, more pointy ears, more pointy face. In fact, a 30 pound coyote probably has ears as big as a 70 pound wolf because of the proportionally larger ears on them. So here are a variety of, of coyotes from different perspectives. And you can really see the differences between wolf and coyote when you see them in some of the same images. So here we see this gray wolf walking in front of this little white pine and the same white pine having a coyote walk in front of it. The coyote's a little bit closer, but it really shows you the, the, that wolf is so much taller than the, the coyote. Uh, 30, 32 inches, as I said, for wolves and deer are about 36, 38 inches. So wolf is almost as tall as, as a deer. And often when people see wolves cross the road ahead of them, um, when you see them a couple of hundred yards or maybe a quarter mile down the road, the first impression often you get is that, oh, there's a deer. Uh, probably more likely than thinking coyote because they're just so long legged, but then you see that long bushy tail and realize you're looking at, at a, a wolf instead of a deer. Another example here of wolf and coyote in the same frame. This is just a couple of hundred yards south of my house in uh, su summer a couple of years ago. So just showing the tallness of the wolf compared to the tallness of the coyote. And <clears throat> a good trick that a person can do is if you capture a wolf on your trail cameras like this wolf I have on a trail camera here about 300 yards east of my house. Uh, show an image of yourself in the same same picture uh, in the same spot and for a six foot tall man, the height of a wolf at its shoulder is about the top of your femur. So that's about what a wolf should be. A coyote should be only knee high. So if you see uh, the, the, the animal just barely getting up to your knees on, on that image, you're probably looking at a coyote. <clears throat> and you can also tell some difference by the tracks. Wolf tracks tend to be very large, very large canid-like tracks. Uh, claws are typically showing on canids, uh, whereas cats don't show claws. Uh, wolf, wolf tracks are typically three and a half, four inches without including the claws in length. 
And they often have a more rectangular appearance than the dog track, which often has a more rounded appearance. And if you look at the claws at the sides on the dog track, they tend to splay outward more, where on wolves, they tend to point forward more. Coyotes have very narrow feet. They are very canid-like in appearance, but they're very narrow, very small, and only about two and a half inches in length. So they overlap some of the mid-sized dogs, but they tend to be more narrow than most of our dog tracks. So wolves are carnivores, <clears throat> excuse me, which uh, it makes them somewhat controversial at times. And uh, some of the studies done in our region show that the average wolf consumes about 15 to 19 adult sized deer per wolf per year. Uh, and a lot of those can be fawns. A study in Michigan showed the average wolf kills about nine fawns. A study in Minnesota showed the average wolf killing about 13 to 15 fawns. So of those adult sized deer, the actual number of deer might be a little bit more because uh, obviously those fawns are not gonna be adult sized. So, it could be 20, 30 deer total when you look at all the fawns they may be consuming. So that seems like a lot of deer that wolves are consuming. They also consume a lot of beaver and studies in the Great Lakes region or especially in Minnesota, uh, Tom Gable studies in uh, Voyagers have shown that the average wolf kills and consumes about eight to 10 beaver per wolf. Uh, and, but it varies a lot. And, and some wolves are not good beaver hunters and, and kill none. And some may be very good beaver hunters and kill as many as 28. Other animals that are also important are like the snowshoe hare, especially when they're, they're abundant. But the average wolf, a wolf will consume as much as 20 pounds at a sitting. So the deer and the beaver are the kind of sized animals they need to fulfill their, their diet needs, their, to satiate themselves. Uh, rabbits are not going to fill them up too quickly and they waste a lot of energy chasing them. So they don't spend a lot of time hunting rabbits. So there have been a couple of studies in Wisconsin that showed food uh, habits of, of wolves. And one was done by Daniel Thompson, who was uh, Eldo Leopold's, I think, his last graduate student. And he published uh, his results in 1952 in the journal Mammalogy. And this is just by frequency of occurrence that so you can have more than 100% because some scats have more than the occurrence of one food item. And he found, Dan found 97% of the scats had beaver in it, 5% uh, had hair, 3% voles, none had, had, had beaver at that time. Uh, so deer were the most important, beaver were almost non-existent at the time, and they were at much lower population uh, densities. Uh, when wolves returned to Wisconsin after being gone for about 15 years, studies were done in the early 1980s. And this is done by the overall volume of, of the food material in the scats and showed that 55% were deer and 16% were beaver. So beaver had jumped up from non-existent in that early study to becoming a fairly important part of the diet. Snowshoe hares continued to be pretty important. Uh, I gave a talk like this on uh, the third, the second of February. So I did have to include that there were some woodchucks, but a very small percent of their diet. And you can see the, the wolf here carrying this, this uh, deer skull. So obviously deer are really what drives uh, wolves as the most important food item. And when you go to other parts of the country, the North America, uh, it can be elk, uh, it can be bison, uh, it can be moose, uh, but it, typically it's going to be the large ungulates, the hooved animals that are the most important food items for them. And there's sometimes some unusual items. So this wolf has a, a bear foot in its mouth and whether it killed the bear or scavenged it, we don't quite know for sure. And here it shows a variety of other animals or things that are eaten by wolves. So uh, studies in the West Coast, uh, Pacific Coast have shown that some wolves are pretty good at hunting salmon. And some recent research in Voyagers National Park shows that wolves in the Great Lakes region occasionally will hunt suckers and, and other fish as well. Uh, this stuffed wolf shows with the turkey and um, I have found a dead turkey next to a wolf den. I found turkey feathers in wolf scats. So I'm sure they occasionally kill turkeys and other birds. I've seen places where wolves have come upon uh, roosting grouse in the snow and, and snatched the grouse, grouse out of the snow. So they do eat a variety of other animals and even eating berries in the summertime. Another study from the Voyagers where it shows this radio collared wolf feeding on blueberries. And they eat a, a scavenge almost any dead animal that they find in the woods. So that's a picture of one near my home, about a third of a mile from my house, feeding on a dead deer that a hunter had uh, had not recovered. 
So what are the impact of wolves and how much of the, uh, how much are they removing of the deer population? Well, I, I did this comparison for Sawyer County where this is kind of the area where our talk would be coming from tonight and just looked at uh, populations of the various carnivores and hunters of, of deer. Uh, so looking at bear and a county like Sawyer County may have as many as 1800 bears living in them. Uh, each bear will consume or kill about one and a half fawns per bear. But because there's such a high number of them, that's about 2,700 deer that bears are consuming. Bobcats, there may be as many as 300 in Sawyer County. They may kill as many as six deer per bobcat. And so that comes out to about 1,800. There probably is a fairly high population of coyotes, uh, as many as 800. They kill and consume about three fawns per year. So about 2,400. Wolves uh, rounding up to about 20 deer per year, uh, and a, but they're, they're living at much lower density. So the 90 wolves that are living in Sawyer County probably are consuming uh, only about 1,800 uh, deer. So when you look at it, the other carnivores uh, either eating as many, killing as many or more, and we care, compare it to human hunters, uh, and this is uh, just the statistics from 2020. It's about 10,000 people that hunt in Sawyer County and about a third of them shoot a deer each year. And uh, so the total was about 3,400 in, uh, in uh, Sawyer County in 2020. So actually the humans are, are killing a few more than most of the other carnivores are. One of the things that we've learned from wolves and the research especially has been found in Yellowstone is that their impact on prey species goes beyond just reducing the, the total density. Uh, they also can have some impacts on the effect of those pre prey species on the vegetation. So in places like Yellowstone that were overpopulated with, with uh, elk uh, in the 1980s and early 1990s where the elk population was up to about 19,000 in, in parts of Yellowstone, and they were overgrazing the vegetation, over browsing, had erosion going down the streams. The coyotes were the most abundant predator on the landscape. They fed heavily on pronghorn antelope fawns, so pronghorn antelope were doing poorly. There's very little regeneration on the aspen trees. Uh, vegetation is, is, is eroding down to the edge of the stream because of the heavy grazing by the elk. Uh, wolves come on the landscape when they were reintroduced in 1995 and you start seeing these uh, effects on the landscape. Willows coming back to the edge of streams, better growth and uh, aspen regeneration. Coyotes are less abundant because wolves are kind of a check on the coyote population. Pronghorn antelope are doing better because of the presence of, uh, of, of wolves and, and, and reducing the, the, uh, the coyotes. And wolves don't spend a lot of time on pronghorn antelope because the adults are too fast and the, the fawns are too small to provide much food for them. So, uh, by, but by reducing the uh, abundance of, of coyotes, they're increasing the abundance of pronghorn antelope. And uh, grizzly bears are doing better because the regular killing of elk by wolves also provides food that the grizzlies can feed on. So there's all these cascading effects in the ecosystem that occurred because of the presence of wolves. Uh, the, the concept of, of trophy cascade has to be carefully uh, discussed though, because there are, I think, examples where this, this process can get over-exaggerated. And uh, sometimes there's an assumption almost made that all you do is add wolves to the landscape and everything goes back to a natural balance. And it's not quite that simple. There are other predators involved. There's hydrological regimes, climatic changes. Uh, so we can't just attribute all of the changes to wolves alone, but, but the, the scientific evidence shows that wolves are an important ingredient in these uh, effects on the landscape. And so we've done some studies in Wisconsin to look at some of the similar effects. Are we seeing some of this in Wisconsin? We had a couple of graduate st students looking at the vegetation in wolf pack areas. And what they found is in the middle of pack territories, there was a richer diversity of wildflowers, the Cecil Bellworts, the Solomon Seals, the Trilliums were growing better, were less heavily browsed. Uh, and there's a greater diversity of, of these wildflowers. Uh, along the edge of wolf pack territories where the deer were concentrating more, there's more grasses and ferns, the, the plants that are not palatable to deer. And so 
uh, the, there was a healthier, more diverse forest in the in the middle of where, where the wolf pack territories were occurring. There were some studies done in, in along the Wisconsin Michigan border showing that uh, maple trees were browsed much less heavily in the middle of wolf pack areas than the edge of wolf pack areas. We're also seeing effects that uh, we're not seeing chronic waste and disease spreading into areas where we have healthy wolf packs in Wisconsin. So it may have impacts and on pack the, on the dynamics of disease spread. So just the other day, my wife Sarah and I were uh, walking, following some wolf tracks near my home here, and we stumbled into this area where it's just a dense growth of regenerating white white cedar. And in my 38 years of working in northern Wisconsin, I've never seen this much young white cedar in one spot. And white cedar is suppressed across much of Wisconsin because of the heavy browsing by deer. Now, I can't say that wolves are the only factor here, but it was certainly kind of interesting that the wolf trail kind of almost led us right to this spot. Some of you may have seen this on my Facebook page, but it's almost like the wolves kind of led us to this spot to show us what they can do uh, on the landscape. One of the other aspects of the impact of, of large predators is they affect populations of mid-sized predators. And I've already mentioned that in Yellowstone, they've probably reduced the abundance of coyotes, which in, in turn has increased the abundance of, uh, of uh, pronghorn antelope. Uh, the studies in, uh, in, along the Michigan-Wisconsin border show that Coyotes are spending much less time in the middle wolf pack areas, and there's a greater abundance of snowshoe hare in those areas. Uh, but that in turn, there's also a greater abundance of red fox in the middle of wolf pack areas because they normally would get suppressed by coyotes. But the image I have here is kind of interesting to me that uh, this is kind of, kind of amazing. DNR pilot captured this some years ago. You're seeing a fisher sitting up in uh, a tree there looking down at a female wolf curl up in a ball laying in front of her den in late winter, early spring, uh, spring, it was probably in April, but there's still some snow on the ground. And we were all excited when we saw this image because this meant this female pup, this female was finally raising pups and had reached a level of adulthood where she was becoming a breeder in her pack. And, uh, but the image of the fisher makes you kind of wonder now, the apex predators are supposed to reduce the abundance of apex predator of the mid-sized predators. But in this case, I wondered if this wasn't a case where there's reverse predation going on that that female wolf, when she's raising pups is and lactating has to get drinks of waters every few hours. And she may be several hundred yards away from the nearest open water area. That fisher could easily run into that den, grab one of those wolf pups and be back up in that tree again before uh, that wolf is back. And this could be a case where the fisher is a bit of a threat to the wolves. But that also would explain why wolves might want to kill fishers and reduce their abundance because the fishers potentially could be a threat to their pups. So wolves are pack animals and a pack basically is a family group. Uh, a typical pack will have the adult breeding pair, have pups that are born in the springtime and the average litter is typically five or six pups. There may be yearlings, wolves that were born a previous spring and still are hanging out in the pack and sometimes older animals. Some of those older animals might include other adults but most often they'll be offspring uh, of that pair. In Wisconsin, the typical territory is about 20 to 80 square miles in the wintertime. And it's called a territory because they defend it against members of their own species using a combination of scent marking, vocalizations, and active aggression. Uh, so here shows an average Wisconsin pack. Uh, this is one over in the Clam Lake area looking up at the pilot flying overhead. Uh, here we see six wolves. The average pack in Wisconsin in mid late winter actually is only about four wolves and we call them packs if there's a, a pair that show breeding activity or show territorial marking behavior. Uh, and up to and the packs can be anywhere from two to up to 12 and in other parts of the country other parts of North America, they can be larger quite a bit larger than that but in our area they tend to be a little bit smaller that's probably because these packs are hunting mainly deer and beaver packs that are hunting 
larger game are going to be consist of bigger packs. So like this pack, I think this is an image from somewhere in Russia of about 25 wolves and packs that size have occurred in Yellowstone. Uh, my wife, Sarah and I did watch the uh, Druid pack in 19 in, two, in 2000, when there were about 25 wolves and running about uh, through the Lamar Valley, through the sagebrush and uh, watching 25 animals running around all together in one large group. Uh, I, I think in three days in Yellowstone, I saw more wolves than I had seen in three years or in 11 years working for the Wisconsin DNR in the wolf program. Uh, and packs this big might have existed in pre uh, European times in Wisconsin when they were, packs would have been hunting elk and moose and bison, but our current packs tend to be smaller in size. So as I said, wolves are territorial. And this is an example of the some of the wolf pack territories in our area. So this is kind of the upper portions of the, the, the Namakagan River. In the center of this map is uh, Lake Namakagan, which is the origins of the Namakagan River, which then runs through. And you can see the Sealy Hills pack that the Namakagan River would run through and then runs through the Sabine Lake pack uh, and other packs nearby. Uh, the, this is actually uh, the packs that existed here about in 2008. Uh, it's changed a little bit since that time, but for most part, these same general areas are still occupied by wolf packs. So this is kind of the distribution of the packs within our area. Uh, you can see the numbers in each pack tells you how many wolves were counted that winter in the pack. And uh, the yellow packs are packs that were represented by at least one radio collared wolf. Uh, the blue packs were represented just by snow track surveys and a couple of the really small packs were just low pairs that had just recently established on the landscape. So they were quite small. That Pigeon Lake pack that's shown as two there now is really occupies all of that area up uh, between the Bibbon Swamp and the Rainbow Lake pack uh, in the Northwest there. So I said that wolves defend their territories by a combination of vocalization, scent marking, and active aggression. So the howling is one way that they advertise their presence. And wolves can hear each other as much as six miles or even further away in forested environments. And if you do the geometry on a six mile radius, that gives you a 115 square mile area that they can advertise their presence. So those 70, 80 square mile territories by howling from the middle of them, they're advertising their presence uh, throughout that area and letting other wolves know this is an occupied area, keep out. Um, we use the information, the, the concept of howling also to survey wolves. And in the summertime, we frequently will we'll do howl surveys where we use our own voice. We drive the forest roads through wolf areas and try to howl at them. We stop every mile and a half or so and get our out of our vehicle and, and try to howl. And if the wolves are near enough uh, to us, they'll howl back. And we can tell by these surveys whether or not there's pups in the pack because of the higher pitch voices. So the howling is one way that they advertise their, te their territories and humans take advantage of that as far as surveying wolves. A second way that wolves advertise their territories are by scent marking. And you can see the real bold markings of the wolves right here of this pack. Uh, they're scraping. There's an RLU, a raised leg urination on the side of the bank. It almost looks like there's some kind of symbol that they're, they're marking up there. But we, uh, the raised leg urination is an indication you've got a breeding pair there. And when you see a double raised leg urination, and if you see some blood in the urine, we know that uh, there's a female that's going to be going into estrus and will be having pups. Uh, some will probably be having pups this spring. So the scent marking tells us a lot. It tells us they're saying no trespassing and there's different uh, signatures. So this is kind of like uh, some of our old uh, prescriptions from our doctors where they they your, use their curse's signature on there to tell you, go ahead and get a, your prescription. They kind of sign their, their scent markings, almost telling other wolves, this is our territory please stay out, please keep out. Although sometimes they're kind of confused, they're not quite sure what to say in this case, it's just kind of a question mark what, what they want to say. And they use scats, uh, the droppings, which are often left in the middle of the roadways or at intersection of trails and roadways to let other wolves know this is an occupied area. And wolves by these scents can probably determine the sex and age and, and uh, the, conditions of the animal of the wolves that are living there. So 
wolves will typically avoid those those areas that are occupied. But if the combination of scent marking and vocalizations doesn't keep other wolves out, there is active aggression. And in places where wolves don't kill, where wolves are not hunted or controlled by humans, the number one mortality factor on wolves are other wolves. And here I'm looking at the alpha male of the Bearsdale pack some years ago when it, it was radio collared and it had died and we determined it was probably killed by other wolves. So it probably got into one of those territorial disputes with a nearby wolf pack. So if there's a risk of getting killed within the pack territory, why would you even bother to do that? Why would you go in a, another pack's territory? Well, there's probably two reasons. If you're a young wolf and you're looking for breeding opportunities, uh, you need to check out the neighborhood. And sometimes you're going to have to trespass through somebody's territory to see if there's any mating opportunities by smelling some of those urination markings or scent markings, they might determine if there's a eligible mate in that pack. Uh, so that would be one reason you would trespass. The other is in the act of hunting, you might chase a prey species into another pack's territory before you make a kill and uh, you quickly kill it and eat it. And, but you want to get out of there as soon as possible before the local pack finds out that you're in their territory. So, uh, Prey opportunities might be a second reason you might trespass. So I want to go through kind of the annual cycle of wolves, and we're right in the middle of their winter nomadic uh, period. So starting at the end of September, early October, the pack becomes this nomadic unit within their territory. They travel about as fairly cohesively within their pack. Uh, individuals might get separated for a short periods of time, but for the most part, the pack is fairly cohesive traveling together from the early part of October until March until they start their, their denning period. And so this is the time when surveys are typically done of wolves because, because the packs are together. So it's a better time to get a count of all the wolves in the pack with just observing their, the, the animals together. Uh, this uh, pack observed from the air gives you uh, a sense though some of the complexities of doing those kind of surveys. So we commonly do track surveys to, to search for wolf tracks to determine how many wolves are in a pack. But here we see one of the complexities that, that can occur. Those three wolves walking along that tire track are walking in each other's tracks. And if you come upon those tracks, it's gonna look like a single wolf probably travel through there. The one going diagonally would give us another wolf. So doing a track survey, initially that might just look like two wolves and you'd have to follow the tracks long enough to where there's some separation so you can get a sense that, oh, it's not just one animal, there's three of them following each other. But there are other cases too that the tracks are quite clear. So here it, with this very shallow snow and the wolves kind of spread out, we can readily see that there are seven wolves going down this uh, this snow covered road. And this is just kind of ideal tracking conditions. Be a little bit more ideal if the other vehicle hadn't gone through there, but it looks like the wolves actually came through after the vehicle because the tracks are accumulating on top of some of those vehicle tracks. So this kind of situation, you can get a pretty good count just from the tracks alone. So <clears throat> I was doing track surveys for like 23 years uh, and had never actually seen a wolf while I was doing a track survey. And in 2014, I was um, doing a survey up near the northern peak of tip of Bayfield Peninsula. And I had sn skied a snow covered forest road about three miles to the edge of Lake Superior. It's a road that's not plowed in the wintertime. So I typically ski it and it's always a good place to find wolf sign, but I'd skied the three miles and I hadn't seen any wolves yet or any wolf sign. And I got to the edge of Lake Superior and you're about 20 feet above the, the lake. And I could see tracks below that to me looked like wolf tracks. And I climbed down the bank through waist deep snow, got down to this, the frozen Lake Superior. And sure enough, there were wolf tracks in front of me. And then I happened to glance off about three quarters of a mile, almost a mile off to the Northwest. And I see four animals on the ice. And, from the distance, even with my binoculars, I can't tell for sure if they're wolf or coyote, but I could see their canids. So I skied in their general direction. I got about a third of a mile closer to some jagged ice sticking up. I looked over the top with my binoculars and could tell these were indeed four wolves sitting on the ice. And I kind of found a road along the edge of the, 
of the, the, the slope of the shore where I thought the wolves probably wouldn't readily detect me and I skied in their direction. I got up within about a quarter mile and two of them started kind of wandering off a little bit to the north. So I thought, okay, they've, they've caught me. I might as well ski toward them and see how close I get. And I got within about an eighth of a mile where the second two got up and the whole group just kind of started wandering off. They weren't overly fearful. So I just started skiing back along the shoreline and the pack sort of start following me, sort of paralleling me for the next five, 10 minutes. One especially started getting closer and closer. And I'm not sure what he was thinking I was, but after a while, they must've figured me out. And I, then they just started running off into the distance. And so this is the image I saw of them, the wolves uh, near one of the Apostle Islands, three of them off in the distance and an additional one ahead of them. And uh, th I thought that was, so I was pretty excited because that's the first time I'd actually seen wolves while I was doing a track survey. On my way back through, as I was driving along Highway 13 and approaching uh, Cornucopia, I and coming by the, the ice caves uh, along the Apostle Islands where there were hundreds of people walking to and from the ice caves. And I realized what those wolves were doing. They were sitting way out in the ice, about three miles from the ice caves and watching the people coming out to the ice cave. So sometimes we watch wildlife, but sometimes wildlife watches us. So uh, during the fall and winter period, some members of the pack may leave uh, and disperse. Uh, and this is because they wanna bre become breeders and you don't typically become a breeder in your home territory, in your home pack. That does happen sometimes if one of the adult pair dies, but for most, most often to become a breeder, animals have to disperse. So they leave their home territory, they travel some distance uh, and uh, try to find either join a new pack or start a pack of their own. And the average distance may be 30 to 50 miles, but there are records of wolves traveling over 400 miles. And we have records from wolves in the Great Lakes region, tagged animals that were detected in Indiana, Northern Missouri from that came through Wisconsin or travel into Manitoba and Ontario. Uh, there have been dead wolves also found in Iowa and Illinois. They were not collared, but uh, genetically were, were wolves of the Great Lakes region. So out of Wisconsin or Minnesota. So we know when they make these dispersal moves, they can move very long distances. Just this last year, the Michigan DNR reported a wolf coming from the eastern part of the UP that traveled the length of the UP into northern Wisconsin and then across central Wisconsin, and then into from central Wisconsin into eastern Minnesota, diagonally across Minnesota, and, and went into Manitoba and then came back into Minnesota where its signal was eventually lost. So uh, sometimes they can make some tremendous movement. That ended up being a case where it was a GPS collared animal. So uh, the Michigan DNR was able to follow it every few hours. The examples on this page show endpoints from radio collared wolves where they were lost in one location and then found in a second location. So the other thing that's occurring right now is we're in the middle of the breeding season of wolves. So February is the main part of the breeding season. There may be some breeding in late January, but the most extensive breeding is in February. And the female will be in estrus for about a week. Uh, so while throughout most of the winter time, the pack is fairly cohesive during that period of of, of uh, asterisk when the, the, the female, the, the adult pair may kind of wander off by themselves a little bit more. Uh, the pack becomes a lot more playful at that time, but they're also very uh, active as far as marking their territory and aggressive toward any neighboring packs. So here's an example of uh, two members of, uh, of the, one of our original Ghost Lake pack, which lived right along the Namakagan River. So these wolves are right on the Namakagan River right during that breeding season. And at the time when this pack first uh, arrived in our area in the late 1990s, it occupied an area along the Namakagan River where it had a territory where parts of it were just north of the Namakaga, north, uh, kind of northeast of Cable. And then it went uh, at a second part of its territory that were over south of Ghost Lake, uh, uh, kind of southeast of Lake Namakagan, about 15 miles east of Cable. So they had a fairly spread out territory. In recent times, those have been split up into other territories, but this was 
the original pair in our area that uh, were the first packs right at the upper portions of Lake of the Lake Namakagan and the Namakagan River. So I, I, I said that uh, the breeding is in February, the gestation period, a period of, of pregnancy lasts about two months or 63 days. And at the end of that period, the pups are then born in a dense site, usually in, er, uh, in early mid April. The female will start spending time at the den in early mid March to prepare the den, but the pups will be born generally in April. And here's an example of a wolf den over in, in Douglas County. Uh, this is right, uh, when I approached this den, I did see several of the pups jump into the den just as I was approaching. And I have to admit that normally we would not go in on a den during the time the pups are there. But in this case, the female wolf from this pack, uh, her radio collar showed that she was on mortality signal, that she was possibly dead. Uh, these radio collars have a special signal in them to let us know when the animal hasn't been moving. And so I I walked out, I wasn't even sure where the den was. I was just walking in to find this potentially dead female. And all of a sudden I see these three pups along the trail that quickly ducked down into their, into their den. I spent about an hour looking for the dead female. I never found her. Uh, and then I thought, well, I, I don't want to spend any more time here because I don't want to disturb the den any more than I have to. Uh, so I figured she probably is not dead, she probably lost her collar. And if the collar drops off or gets torn off somehow, it also makes a mortality signal. And I returned about two months later after the pups had gone and did find the collar in a pile of leaves and it had been badly chewed up but only as part of the transmitter was still alive. But in this case, the female was not dead. So luckily the, it was just a collar had come off of her. So as I mentioned, I saw the pups and the pups do start spending time outside their den uh, when they're about three weeks old. Uh, they still stay at the den site for most of the first two months. And most of that time, they're still dependent on the mother's milk. Occasionally toward the end of that period, they'll start feeding on regurgitated meat, but for most part, they're still fairly dependent on milk. So by the time the pups are about two months old, they're big enough, they no longer need to be left in the den site and the pack moves them to a summer home site we call the rendezvous sites. And rendezvous sites are, are often forest openings and the pack will be using those from mid June until the end of September. And they're called rendezvous sites because pack members this time of the year are not hunting so much as a group, they're kind of hunting by themselves. They kind of wander off by themselves in different directions from the pack from the dead area or the rendezvous area and then come back on their own from in different directions. So uh, the rendezvous sites then represents a place where they all rendezvous at the end of their hunting activity. And the pups at this stage are being fed by the adults, mainly by regurgitated food that they're bringing back for them. And these rendezvous sites can vary considerably. Sometimes they use big open fields such as this one, this female, looks like she has four or five pups with her. Uh, this pack over in uh, central Wisconsin are using an area along a sand two track road in a kind of an opening of the forest. Uh, this pack, you can see kind of this meadow area that they're using from that we could see from the air. This is a radio collared pack and you can see the adult female off to the southeast. And uh, you can see the pups then further off into this open meadow area. Here's an unusual rendezvous site. This is in central Wisconsin where this pack happened to be using a rendezvous site that was also being used as a staging area for sandhill cranes and whooping cranes. And what's kind of interesting about this image is that the only place in North America where you can see, where you could potentially see whooping cranes and a breeding population of gray wolves would be in Wood Buffalo National Park in Alberta, Canada and in central Wisconsin. So we're kind of unique that we have this opportunity in Wisconsin. Other places that are used for rendezvous sites are, are cranberry bogs. And that becomes a favorite for, for them sometimes in central Wisconsin. Some of these become unfortunately nuisance packs because the, the pups become almost too habituated to the presence of people in these sites. Or they might even use like an open pine plantation and Sometimes they have to share with other critters like these wolf pups over in Ashland County, they're having to have this porcupine in the middle of their rendezvous site. 
And uh, a common feature of rendezvous sites are wolves do take advantage of human foods provided food sources. So these five, five pups <clears throat> are feeding on a bear bait and just kind of show you the sequence that these bear baits are covered with, with uh, stumps. Uh, but once the bear removes that, and you can see the top left image there, the bear, there's a gray wolf sitting behind there, waiting patiently for the bear to get done so that the wolves can start feeding on it. And then the pups start feeding on the same items that are left at the bear bait. So we do see these bear baits often being used by wolves at, at their rendezvous site. Some packs may even be selecting rendezvous sites based on bear baits. And one of the reasons we have conflicts with hunting dogs and wolves in the summertime, excuse me, let me take a sip of water here, that these same rendezvous sites are being visited by both wolves and bears and, and the dogs are sometimes encountering wolves and the packs are just being defended, defensive of their pups at these sites. So that's where we have some of these conflicts. <laughs> so a little bit about history of wolves in our region. Um, at the time of European settlers first started arriving in our region. We had a rich diversity of large uh, ungulates that were potential food for wolves. We had caribou in the far north. We had moose across northern Wisconsin, the UP of Michigan and northern Minnesota. Uh, bison would have been occurring in the prairie regions of southern western Minnesota, southern Wisconsin. Elk would have probably been involved in, in, in the oak savannas throughout the region. And deer would have been uh, occurred throughout the region, more abundantly in the southern parts of the region, probably at lower densities in the north and, and probably wouldn't have occurred north of Lake Superior. But we also had a, quite a variety of food items and beaver would have been spread out throughout this region. The area also would have had just prior to European settlement, uh, a variety of other nations living here. The Ojibwe here in Northern Wisconsin, the Menominee in Northeast Wisconsin, Ho-Chung in the central part of the state, the Fox in Southwestern Wisconsin, the Dakota people were in very Northwest Wisconsin and uh, although had been further in, in Wisconsin earlier on, and then the Potawatomi in the Southeast parts of the state. So wolves shared the landscape with a lot of native uh, nations. And uh, for most part, there was a, they were fairly uh, cohesive relationship. Uh, the, the tribes admired the wolves. They are an important part of the culture of many Native American uh, tribes. Uh, there are many, most of these tribes had, had wolf clans. So the wolf was a highly admired and uh, appreciated animal. Uh, but when our European ancestors came over to the landscape, they had sort of different opinions and Europeans were more herding people and livestock raising people. So uh, they found wolves to be more in competition with them. And soon after Europeans started settling in the area, there were bounties being placed on wolves and the state of Wisconsin had a bounty system, people paying to, uh, to kill wolves that lasted from 1865 to 1960 or 1957, I should say. Uh, the bounty ended in 1957, and Wisconsin was the first U.S. state, I think, that prote protected gray wolves. But unfortunately, by that time, the population was already so low that they probably were extirpated. They were extirpated by about 1960. So we went from a population that uh, initially was maybe three to 5,000 throughout the 1800s, early 1900s was declining to the point by 1960 had mostly disappeared from the state. And for about 15 years, we considered them an extirpated population of animals. We had occasional loners passing through, but no evidence of a breeding population. And then about the mid 70s, we started getting wolves coming back in the state and several things happened. So after Wisconsin eliminated its bounty in 1957, Michigan ended its in 1960, Minnesota 1965. And that reduced some of the incentive of people going out and killing wolves. Uh, but, um, but the populations were already so low that they still resulted in, in disappearing from Wisconsin and Michigan. But it perhaps pr protecting them uh, set the stage and removing some of the, the financial incentives set the stage for recovery to start. And then the 1973 Endangered Species Act provides high levels of protection. And shortly thereafter, we see wolves starting to return to Wisconsin. So they came here on their own, spreading in from Minnesota. Uh, a common myth is that they were reintroduced, which is not the case in Wisconsin. There was a case in Yellowstone, there was a case in central Idaho, but in Wisconsin, they came back on their own. 
And so, uh, yeah, mid 70s, we have wolves coming back into the northwest part of the state, just kind of north of the St. Croix, between the St. Croix River and uh, Lake Superior was kind of the avenue, the corridor that wolves moved back into Wisconsin. So with the return of wolves to the state, the Wisconsin DNRs did start a formal monitoring program in the fall of 1979, uh, capturing wolves in the spring and summer and then radio collaring them and following them year round. Uh, early years uh, was mostly by uh, VHF radio collars, uh, which were, uh, you had to find, find them by airplane or, or telemetry equipment on the ground. And normally we do, obtain one location a, a week. Uh, currently, the department is going to GPS satellite collars, and that allows you to locate wolves at whatever setting you want to set the, the radio collar to, but often several times a day. So you get a lot more locations. You get a much better sense of the actual area where wolves are living. Plus, you can look, check them more out at night, which with VHF collars, when you're flying them with airplanes, would be hard to do at night. But it costs money, it takes time to get wolves collared. So the department, uh, DNR also relies heavily on snow track surveys. And uh, these consist of slowly driving forest roads or skiing along tracks. And uh, uh, since 1995, there has been a volunteer component to this, these track surveys. And, and my wife, Sarah, is still a DNR employee who does the surveys, but I do them as a volunteer as do, uh, 70, 80 other people across the state. And uh, it's, it's a way to get out in the wintertime and, and also a, a chance to see a wide variety of tracks. And, and sometimes you're lucky enough to actually see them. Uh, the DNR also relies on public observations, uh, images people capture of wolves seen near their property or uh, when they're walking or traveling, or even setting in images of tracks or reporting visual observations where you don't get uh, pictures, but giving able to give good descriptions of the animals that you saw. So all of that data then is used for determining the minimum count. And uh, up until 2020, the, the counting system cons was considered a territorial mapping system where attempts were made to try to locate each map each pack across the state, the extent of each pack's area, and count all the wolves in that pack. And so this uh, map shows us the distribution of wolves the first year of surveys across the state. And you can see the purple are packs that are radio colored. So those are shown as, as uh, these polygons, because the polygon basically represents the, the connecting the, the outer dots uh, of all the radio locations. Uh, and so you see four packs in Northwest Wisconsin and one pack in North Central Wisconsin, just kind of North of Wausau. That pack was only surveyed by snow, by snow track surveys. And here's a distribution of wolf packs in 1990. And we continue to have similar cluster there in, in Douglas County, Northwest Wisconsin, but they start spreading out across Northern Wisconsin so that Averill Creek Pack in North Central Wisconsin, we've got a clustering of packs between them. The Rainbow Lake Pack is the first pack in Bayfield County. And there's a little pack over in extreme Western Burnett County, Northwestern Polk County, right along the St. Croix River. And you could see kind of a, a branch there of areas that seem to be probable wolf range and that the St. Croix Riverway was an important part of a travel corridor for wolves at that time period. And you see the similar thing here in 2001, 2002, that we continue to have this kind of corridor going along the St. Croix Riverway as an important travel corridor for wolves. And we see several packs along that corridor. And at the upper end, we see quite a clustering of packs as we get in the Douglas and uh, Washburn counties. And this last map here, or this map, not the last one, but this is the last time this particular map will be shown or done. This was the, this kind of the end of a, of a era here that in 2012, this is the last map showing the exact locations of all the wolf pack territories across Wisconsin. And the reason this is the last year the exact map was shown is because after that point, wolves became a game species and it was deemed no longer appropriate to show the exact location of each pack. And this map shows the purple are packs that are radio collared. Uh, 
The blue are packs that were radio collared in previous years, and but were relying on snow track surveys that winter. And then the yellow are packs that are relying just on snow track surveys alone. And because they became a hunted species after this point, uh, the exact locations of all the packs is no longer being being uh, shown. But so this is the last year, 2012, that this map was shown. The most recent pack map uh, just shows these generalized circles for where packs are located, the pink being packs that are have been there for several years, the blue being packs are just being uh, newly discovered. Uh, and 2020 is actually the last year this map will be shown because the department has now gone to a new system of surveying wolves that no longer relies on determining exact location of each pack territory, but it's called occupancy modeling, which is more of a it, it, computer generated system it still relies heavily on snow track surveys but using statistical methods it kind of can account for missing observations and come up with a more more of an exact estimate of the total population where previously we relied more on a minimum count so this graph shows that minimum count and how that's changed over time with 25 wolves counted the first year a slow growth of the population uh, it it shows the background here, the pink represents when they're federally endangered. The yellow represents when they're a threatened species, which gave the state some limited authority to use some lethal controls. And the green represents periods when the state had full management authority, allowed the state to use lethal controls and consider a hunting season, which is why we see the dip in uh, 2013. Uh, but uh, 2014, the population increases to 746 while there's still a hundred species. So uh, it demonstrates that the hunting itself does not necessarily decimate wolf population. Even with hunting, the population still can be allowed to grow. And then we see the population kind of stabilizing at about 900 some animals in recent years. It jumps up to about 1,034 in 2020, but, uh, uh, but staying uh, only a little bit above what it had been the previous couple of years. So one of the downsides of wolf uh, recovery has been that there have been depredations and this map shows the uh, depredations this last year or so the the red represents hunting dogs the green represents farms that had depredations what's kind of interesting about this the farms are generally at the edge of main wolf range there are more marginal wolf areas but the red where the hunting dogs occur are in the core of wolf pack area, areas. And as I talked about earlier, at these rendezvous sites, which are in the middle of wolf pack areas are where these kind of depredations typically occur. So this uh, just next series of slides just kind of shows you probably the average, the more common encounter with wolves that most of us probably will ever have. And uh, some years ago, I found a dead deer about a third of a mile from my house that a hunter had shot but had not retrieved. Uh, it was right at the end of the deer hunting season. So I, I put a trail camera near the deer just to see what was going to be feeding on it. And um, about a week after I'd had the camera up and we'd had some snows that had fallen between then, I was walking toward, toward the, the carcass location, going through some dense balsams and uh, walking with my dog, English setter, and all of a sudden she had gone and I couldn't see where she was. And I looked ahead of me, about 50 feet ahead of me, I see a brown animal looking at me and I yelled for my dog and she quickly was at my feet. But the wolf then looked at me and this was the pretty close to where the wolf was at the time. Uh, right after I yelled at my dog, this was what the wolf looked like. And if you look at the time up there, this was uh, three o'clock and just less than two minutes later, I was uh, removing some of the snow from in front of my camera. So this wolf was right ahead of me. And the typical behavior of a wolf when they encounter people, they just run away. But there are occasions where they, where they don't run away and there have been some attacks on dogs. So that does happen, but it's not a common occurrence. So uh, I'm gonna kind of wrap it up with a little bit of talk about the recent uh, hunting seasons, and then I'll open it up to some questions here toward the end. So uh, with uh, the last, with the delisting in 2012, the state legislature established a wolf hunting and trapping season. It did have some input by DNR, but very limited, and it was more dictated by uh, interest by stakeholder, some certain stakeholder groups. Um, it, it did allow the DNR to limit the quotas and the permits in harvest zones. 
Uh, it established a season that would run from October 15th through the end of February, and that was changed after 2014, so it would still would become the first Saturday of November after 2014. Um, it required the reporting within 24 hours after a person had harvested a wolf. Uh, it did allow the use of dogs to hunt wolves, but that was not authorized until after the firearm deer season, which is the end of November. And as it turned out, the hunting seasons that were allowed, the use of dogs are very limited. Uh, the quotas stayed usually within two or three of what the intended quota is, what it was supposed to be. The actual harvest, I should say, stayed within a two or three wolves of the intended quota. Uh, so 2012, I think the quota was 2015 that year and 117 were removed. 2013 was 254 and 257 were removed. In 2014, it was 150 and 154 were removed. Uh, and I should point out that 2013, that dip we saw on that graph, that occurred that year. But 2014, with that harvest of 154 wolves, the population actually still grew after that. Well, the most recent delisting occurred in January 4th of 2021. And that was across all of the lower 48 states where gray wolves were known to occur, except the Mexican gray wolves in Southern New Mexico and Arizona, and the Northern gray wolves that had been previously delisted. The Mexican gray wolves continue to be listed as endangered, but the Northern gray wolves, Northern Rocky gray wolves, were already delisted in 2011, and so there, there was not a need to delist them. Uh, but uh, I should point out, as of today, a judge in California has, has relisted wolves, so uh, all these areas are back on the endangered species list. And so that delisting that occurred in, in January of 2021 was reversed today. So uh, there will not be a possibility of a hunting season this next fall uh, until again, wolves are removed from the federal endangered species list. And that's usually a several year process. So I don't see that happening anytime soon within the next year or two. So with the hunting, with the delisting that occurred this last year, uh, the department DNR wanted to wait until the fall of 2021 to hold a wolf hunting season. But instead, because of a court challenge, the DNR was forced to hold a wolf hunting season. And what, one of the arguments was because you theoretically could hold a wolf hunting season up until the end of February, and there was still time for a wolf hunting season. So the DNR was forced to hold a wolf hunting season last February for the last six days of February. Uh, and because it was past the end of the firearm deer season, all these areas were open up to using hounds, which had only been used on a very limited basis in, in the previous hunts and resulted instead of six days of hunting, it, it, the DNR had to close it in three days and an over harvest of 183%. The quota was set at 119 and 218 wolves were harvested. And so some zones, it was almost three times as high as what the intended quota was supposed to be. So a drastic over harvest of the wolf population, which resulted in series of lawsuits. Uh, uh, but before I get into that, uh, the, the, the DNR had intended on uh, trying a harvest of 130 this last fall. The Natural Resource Board that governs the DNR had up that to 300. That resulted in a lawsuit in the state court. And that, that lawsuit in the state court uh, passed an injunction which stopped the hunt. The DNR did return to a quota of 130 defying the Natural Resource Board, but the injunction was already in place. And, and, and then a second uh, hearing was held on a uh, by the tribes uh, because that the way the harvest was being designated denied the tribes opportunity to have part of that harvest set aside for them and not harvested. And that judge did not rule in part because an injunction was already in, underway. But uh, since that time, as of today, as I said, uh, wolves were on, on another federal lawsuit and that just the overall delisting of wolves, wolves were again returned to endangered species list today. So department did start work on a new wolf management plan. The last plan was completed in 1999. The DNR expects to be coming out with that plan later on this winter or early spring. So urge folks to look for that and comment on the plan when it comes out. The other thing happening this spring is Wisconsin residents will have opportunity to comment on 
whether you approve the use of dogs for hunting wolves, the Spring Conservation Congress hearings that are held in each county across the state uh, on the 11th of April, and you can attend those virtually, uh, will have a question on there whether you approve the use of dogs for hunting wolves. So this, while that the recommendations will not have any effect of law, it, it does let officials know people's opinion on what, what they, how they feel about using using dogs to hunt wolves, whether they feel that's an appropriate way to hunt wolves. And then just kind of round off with some of the things we want to do to try to reduce conflicts with wolves and living with sharing the land with wolves, uh, avoid feeding wolves or feeding pets outside in wolf areas, uh, avoid feeding deer in areas that might attract wolves, don't allow dogs to run at large in wolf areas, turn lights on and accompany your dog going outside after dark if you live near wolf pack areas, avoid den or wolf kill sites with your dogs, learn wolf sign tracks and scats and other sign to avoid uh, encountering wolves with, with your dogs, don't leave carcasses of dead animals exposed at home or farm sites, uh, stand tall and be aggressive to any wolf not showing normal fear and any wolf that displays any kind of bold or tame behavior, uh, report those to DNR. And with that, I will open it up to questions. Great, thank you so much, Adrian. Um, so much information and I didn't realize how timely this presentation was gonna be. Um, that's great, good news. Um, so a couple people have put their questions in chat. Are you able to see that at all, Adrian? Do you or do we... would you just read those? I I, yeah. I would prefer if you guys would just read them. Then I don't have to look at them. Yeah, that it, it's it'd be simpler for me just to have them read to me. Sure. Let's see. So the first question we got was from Deborah Lake. Oh, and it's moving. Every time someone adds a new question, I <laughs> I'm losing it. Um, when in February do wolves go into estuaries and does it vary by wolf? Yes, there's individual variation. It can be anywhere from very late part of January uh, up until early part of March even, but it, it varies by individual wolf. So I think the older wolves probably come into estrus a little bit earlier and a younger wolf, the, they, they normally come in their first estrus for female would be when they're approaching their second birthday. And uh, the, the first time it's probably more likely to be a little bit later, whereas they're, when they become more mature, it's probably gonna be a little bit earlier. But I should point out that wolves are seasonal uh, uh, estrus. So it just, they can't really impact too much when their estrus starts which is in contrast to cats, which are induced ovulators and cats, the presence of a male can cause them to come into estrus where that's not the case in wolves. The presence of a male has nothing to do with it. If they're a female's by herself, she's gonna come into estrus if she's an adult female. Okay, uh, there's another question here from um, Joan Cervenka and some of it might have been answered in the latter part of your presentation, but she's wondering about the impact of the wolf slaughter or hunt to the Wisconsin wolf population. So I think you went through a lot of that, but is there anything you'd like to add there? Sure. So the harvest that was done in 2021 was fairly aggressive. We think it probably reduced the size of the wolf population. Uh, we did house surveys last summer to try to determine if there was reduced uh, numbers of pups in packs and we had some indication that data is still being analyzed and being carefully examined, but some indication there was less packs that are had pups in them than, than previous years. Uh, the surveys are underway right now to determine wolf pack distribution and the size of pack size. And we'll, we'll see at the end of this winter whether there's a reduction in a number of wolves and, and size of packs. We suspect that it probably reduced the wolf population some. Uh, if there would have been another hunt in the fall as had been designated, I'm sure there would have been more of an impact, but because that hunt in the fall was stopped, the impact is probably not gonna be that major. And I think within a year or two, the population probably can get back to the level that it had been in 2017 through 2020. Great. Um, let's see, we've got a wolf sighting in Osceola and then somebody wondering about 
a um, or how or specifically where do we send an info on reporting a wolf sighting? Great question. Yeah, so the DNR on their website has a large mammal observation form. If you go on Gray Wolf website, you can find it there. You can probably just go for large mammal observation form as well, uh, but it, it, it'll be in a couple of different places. But it's if you go on the Gray Wolf uh, website of the DNR, you'll find a, a place where you can report those observations. And yeah, the department is really interested in getting those kind of reports. Uh, there's a question from Terry Bachland about how much does poaching influence the Wisconsin wolf population? Well, research that was done through 2012 by Jen Stenglin at UW Madison, she's now a research scientist with the DNR, showed that um, over the years, about a little bit under 10% of, of wolves one year or older die each year from, from poaching, from illegal killing. So uh, one out of 10 wolves probably die each year from illegal killing on the average. And, and during the early years of wolf recovery in the early 1980s, it probably was even higher, 15% uh, maybe even or, or more uh, died each year from illegal killing. So it can be a factor that uh, impacts the wolf population. And to what extent the, the population was kind of stabilizing in 2017, 2018, 2019, Illegal kill might have been one of the factors that people were were illegal killing wolves. And I should point out that not all illegal killing is necessary. People just going out trying to kill wolves. Some of it is people hunting during deer season when you can shoot a coyote and shooting an animal and mistaking wolf for a coyote or people hunting coyotes uh, in large open areas where sometimes you're shooting at animals 200, 300 yards, and sometimes you can't see them well enough. So there are some mistaken identification, but there are also intentional uh, cases of people trying to kill wolves. But uh, getting a good measure on that's always a challenge. All right, and then a question from Ann Lane. Um, she said she had always thought that wolves were reintroduced back into Wisconsin. Um, but you had talked about that they were returned naturally. That's so correct. Wondering yep. if you could talk a little bit about why why the reimbursement for agricultural or pet depredation. Well, uh, so yeah, for agricultural pet depredation, I think it's been always perceived that we don't want wolves to be a burden on any uh, members of society. And so for people raising livestock in areas where there are wolves, it's always been perceived as a, a fair and reasonable thing to do uh, uh, for to reimburse them for animals that are lost because of wolf depredation. So uh, I think uh, from a fairness standpoint and uh, because they're losing valuable animals uh, and that they get reimbursed for those. In the case of hunting dogs, uh, people wonder about that and the dogs are being used for hunting bears and uh, the the accident, the wolf attacks occur when they're in the act of, uh, of chasing uh, of a hunting activity. Uh, and people sometimes disagree whether that payment should be made. But I think there's some good reasons that paying for those as well, because by paying for those, we are getting very good reports on exactly where these are occurring. We have federal agents that investigate those uh, those uh, depredations. We know exactly which packs are involved. It's a very a, a powerful public information source. Uh, the department can designate caution areas to warn other hunters that a pack has started killing dogs. So uh, by, by paying for those, it, it can provide some useful information. And also for the hunters who are gonna be kind of angry and uh, at wolves after they kill a dog, um, instead of going ahead with some bad behavior like trying to kill any wolf they can find, if they know they need to call a government agent over to investigate, to get reimbursed, it may disrupt what could be some bad behavior and, and, and result in, in more reasonable behavior. Okay, right, thank you for clarifying that. Um, Annette Paul is wondering, why would a wolf's behavior change near humans to be aggressive? Well, I, it's a case of wolves becoming too uh, habituated to people and uh, uh, seeing people as uh, being near people as a potential food. And, and then uh, 
part, the next step could be kind of aggressiveness toward people. Uh, uh, there have been cases of wolves killing people in North America twice in the last century or so, uh, wild wolves, and their wolves are probably fed close to people. And uh, yeah, when, when they become overly uh, uh, bold, there is that risk that they may become aggressive toward people. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, it's something you don't want wolves to become. You want wolves to be, remain fearful and, and stay away from people. Okay, um, we've got one question about uh, so that our recent delisting. Does that mean that there's no hunt, no more hunting in wolves at this point? As long as they're on the endangered species list, there is no hunting of wolves. That's correct. The, the DNR cannot hold a wolf hunting season. Uh, Minnesota, when these reclassifications occur in Minnesota because they are designated in 1978 as a threatened population versus endangerment in Wisconsin and Michigan, they uh, still can use lethal controls for dealing with problem wolves that are causing depredation on livestock. Wisconsin and Michigan don't have that option because they're, they're listed as endangered. So when they're listed endangered, the only authority the state has for using lethal controls are in human safety situations when wolves are perceived to have gotten to be overly aggressive. Right, and then I think the last question we're we'll take today, just for time's sake, um, is from Nick Pernsteiner. Pernsteiner, sorry if I messed up your last name there. Um, it is, what is your opinion of the unusually tame wolf that was recently reported at Voyagers Park that approached a group of snowmobilers? Um, I guess I didn't see that particular story, but we've had cases of that happening in Wisconsin several times in the past uh, where a wolf seems, and, and I think it's a case of habituation. They've learned to feed on foods that are close to people and they don't, sh and they don't show normal fear of people. Uh, in our case in Wisconsin, it's more often been road wolves, wolves that are living along roadways. And we suspect in most cases, it's probably young wolves that have recently dispersed from their home pack and they haven't learned how to hunt well. They've learned the easiest way to feed was fighting road kills and get so used to feeding on road kills at the edge of roadways that they let vehicles go by them and kind of get used to that. And after a while, they sort of get used to the presence of people. So I think it's just a case of a wolf that that's become too used to being around people. And if we think in terms of wolves that they're the answers of our dogs that they have the ability to become habituated to people and live close to people. They, they still have that in their genes. So uh, certain situations, behavioral situations will allow them to become more uh, 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 bold and, and less fearful of people. So in the wild and for maintaining a healthy wild wolf population, we really want to discourage that because it often leads to uh, a tame wolf being a dead wolf. Sure. All right. Well, thank you so much, Adrian. Um, and thank you to everybody who was on today. I think we had 98 people total that I saw. Um, That's what I highest... saw too. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. And well, well, uh, thank you for having me. Adrian, I don't think I've uh, ever heard someone talk that long about something so specific with that much excitement. So that was oh, amazing. Well, oh, well, thank and you I, very much. I think I only heard you uh, take a sip of water twice, which I don't get how anybody can do that. So <laughs> I, I think I took five, but I was more curious. Five. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, thank well, you, you didn't so see much. me take a sip of my beer too. <laughs> yeah. I, like I said, uh, I, for those of uh, you who are participating, uh, I tried to get Adrian on here by uh, bribing him with beer and it, it worked. So I'm going to have to get up there and get you a beer someday. Um, Sounds but yeah. good. We're definitely going to keep you in mind for future events for uh, those okay. who are still here. Uh, take a look at our upcoming events uh, at our website. Um, look at us on Facebook, on Instagram. Our website is wildriversconservancy.org. Um, and you can find more events like this one today uh, on that website. And uh, again, we hope to get Adrian doing something with us again in the future. So keep an eye open for that as well. So yeah, we could we could maybe talk about the St. Croix Cougar. There we go. I've heard about uh, that. And I. Yeah. I I think I, I saw a chat about somebody asking about a cougar. So uh, ah. that'd be, that'd be smart. And if there are additional questions yet, uh, I think my, my email is still showing up there that people are welcome to contact me uh, if they have additional questions. And uh, we can go through some of those questions that are left in the chat too. 
Okay. Um, so that way we can uh, get those too. But thank you for being so flexible, meeting okay. with us over Zoom. We did have someone from England who obviously couldn't uh, participate in Hayward. Oh, so they're going to be getting it. I think they're asleep right now, but they'll be getting a recording of this, uh, this program. So we're international oh, with this one, which is awesome. Oh, good. Good. Well, thank you. It was fun, fun talking to you tonight. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you again, Adrian. Everybody else. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good night. Yeah. Have a good, good night. night.